Hello everyone, it's your Carlton here. Welcome to another awesome day. I'm back today once again, three days in a row. It's awesome training. Today is day three of three days of FileMaker Server. Kind of training, but kind of update. So it's content that you haven't seen before. It's not really a repeat, largely because Claire's came out with new versions of their FileMaker product. And uh, so we are broadcasting, as you can see here on Discord, Twitch and YouTube. So if you want to join the conversation, feel free to do that. If you're on YouTube or Twitch, really you can lurk in the background and no one knows you're there. Feel free to do that. But if you have a question, definitely ask the question, type it in. Um, you don't have to register uh, on uh, Twitch to uh, to put a question or a comment in there. On YouTube, I think they uh, require a username password. Uh, Michael Gravel from Montreal is there. Welcome, Michael. Obviously, Agent Chevy, Dave Learning, Dave Angel, Dennis Chow, Ed Elzo. Elzo did a really nice video for us about, hey, it's great FM training. Come visit, hang out with us. I got one person who did that, right? So I guess I got to make a video about how we have one person who watches the video and enjoys it, right? Um, that'll be interesting. Gaditi, Jay Dripper, Jerrica One, John Haggerty, Mikey Ken, Mikey, another Mikey. Uh, the names keep bouncing around. We got Net Lobster who's doing a post some artwork, I think, updated artwork for us. Hopefully she does that in the channel. That would be kind of cool. She is an artist, so when she's bored not doing FileMaker, she starts drawing pictures, right? Saw a little of that yesterday. Pretty exciting. Obviously, we got Oregon Dean here. Uh, we got Sven, uh, Scott, uh, and then, of course, Jacob Taylor is going to be here, along with our moderator, TK55678. The Stormtrooper will be moderating, and he can ban you if you misbehave. So this is Jacob Taylor. These are the evil penguins. They are here uh, as representatives of Linux, and that's the conversation for today. So FileMaker, a little bit of quick history here. Uh, well, well, first off, we're doing live training every day, 1 o'clock. Right. We're glad you're here. We're thrilled you're here. If you'd like to know what the upcoming schedule is for the, this, it's basically kind of, it's Claris's product, but it's FileMaker platform. Uh, the upcoming broadcast schedule, if you go to fmtrain.tv up here, you can press the live button right here on the left, and then you can see the upcoming schedule. This is a feed out of FileMaker. Today is day three. Tomorrow, Nick Hunter is back for one day this week. Uh, he'll be talking about wrecking solutions. Um, and then on Friday, we have kind of an open question answer day again. Um, depending on what happens today and tomorrow will kind of set the tone for what Friday is, right? Very important. Next week, we got virtual bars with Christian Olson, some new virtual tab and some other stuff. And once again, Nick Christian is playing a lot with the add-on modules. So you probably can weasel your way into that a little bit of the conversation. Then next week, Wednesday, we got Nick back for some uh, handling large data relationships with the FileMaker platform. So if you want to help Support the channel, which we really, truly appreciate because this all costs a lot of money because Jacob doesn't volunteer his time and Haley and, My and Miles and, and Nick. I have to pay all of them to uh, show up and do this. And the way we pay for that is when people buy the learning bundles here. So if you buy one of the FileMaker training learning bundles, it comes with a um, uh, copy. This one here has got everything you need in it, a specialized version of a CRM. It's also got all our training uh, updates for a year and a full copy of the FileMaker Pro for one person. Um, if you need a license for more than one person, let me know. We'll, we'll get that uh, squared away and help you out with that. Um, there's also, if you already have FileMaker but you still want to support us, definitely purchase the five hour uh, or five hour. The, uh, the 199 uh, bundle, and it includes um, all the courses, all the courses, and, and including the legacy courses. So we don't really sell the courses individually anymore. Like, I just want the 18 course or the 16 course or the 19 course. It's a complete bundle to get all of it because there's so many products. It's a little overwhelming. Like, if you come to individual courses, we really don't sell the, the current ones anymore. We call it FileMaker Platform. We put the year on it. At some point, we suspect Claris will probably start naming their product a little differently. Um, I'm not totally clear on what their strategy is on that. I thought they would have done something on that already a little bit more. But if you look at all the courses we've created over the years, someone goes, hey, you know, uh, I need a sample file from like uh, like a month ago where Nick was talking about blah, blah, blah. To, to help everyone out, we create, we have over 6,000 videos we've created. 6,000, right? Um, we create generally more than one a day on average, right? So, and I'm talking seven days a week average, right? So we create at least one every day, if not more, like uh, one and a half to two videos a day. Um, so you see some of them here, some of them go into the paid video course. That's why you want the paid video training. It's that good. So really recommend you do that. So once again, that's what the bundles are for. So a little bit of history on this. Uh, so years ago, years ago, years ago, back in FileMaker five, six days, there was a version of FileMaker server uh, for Linux. 
And I know about as much about Linux then as I do now. Actually, I know more about it now, but only because of accidental exposure. But um, it wasn't super well received. And, and in the days of FileMaker 5 and 6, the platform really had a lot of issues. Um, and uh, I mean, it always has issues, and we're always making it better. But if you look back, it was pretty rough what we had, and the performance was pretty rough. And people were still trying to use it over the internet. And, and so it never really quite took off. It took a lot of money to work on it. And so Claris kind of shelved it. And, and so it's, it's been there all along. And what happened was is that there's a new management team at Claris. They've been there about, a, a, oh, coming up on two years here pretty soon. And one of the things they did is they resuscitated that old product. It was on the shelf. In fact, the guy who had worked on who kept it up to date had retired. So they had to go back to this guy who's like 55 plus, who's enjoying retirement, I'm sure, drag, you know, throw, I don't know what they promised him or how they paid him, but I, he had plenty of money, I know, <laughs> Apple stocks and stuff. Uh, but for whatever reason, they convinced him to come back, and he was even at DevCon briefly, and he kind of resuscitated the product because he's the only one who knew how it really worked. And so him coming in, he fixed the bugs, got it up to date, and then did a knowledge transfer between himself and, I guess, the team so they can support it moving forward. So that's this version that we're going to talk about today. It's the first official, official, like, Golden Master approved version for use on Linux in a long, long time. It's version FileMaker Server 19.1.2. Um, there have been versions previous to this over the last six or eight, ten months. The, those have been beta versions or what they call preview release. They're basically versions. Some of those versions were really bad. They ate database files. They destroyed files. And so once again, um, if you want to test and be part of a beta program, Claris will be happy to add you to that, but their software may, their, their, their versions of FileMaker may eat your database, right? Literally. Um, uh, and, and if they do that, you know, that you sign a waiver saying, hey, uh, you're not going to whine at them if you can't use it in a production environment. If you do and it eats a million dollars, they don't care. It's up to you to only use approved official software for official projects, right? Makes sense. So uh, there's my, uh, there's the, uh, there's the revised artwork. I've got that look on my face. How's my look? Little better, little better. I don't. I look like I'm. I'm grimacing quite so bad. That's nice. I like the dead bird artwork. So that is on. I can show it to everyone here. So one of the people here, Net Lobster, she does artwork of animals, and she also threw artwork together of me and stuck it on Discord. This is me. So let me see. I'm trying to simulate my look. It's kind of like I got one side of my lip kind of crinkled up. Pretty good artist, right? Really amazing. So she did some cat artwork for me. Uh, I have some. Um, people in my family that are impossible to buy and so I'm gonna get them some uh, cat artwork I give her the photos that comes artwork of the cat and everyone's happy for Christmas but scratching off the Christmas list which is awesome so real quick Jacob Taylor are you ready to walk us through the installation so we're gonna do an install today of Linux the the FileMaker server 19.1.2 for Linux end-to-end -end, and we're doing it on Amazon right so yep. Jacob are you ready to kick this over and then I'm going to kind of look at the Q&A side of the world and try to uh, see if I can hmm, see if I can find the you know this will be exciting we'll see what issues we are running into <laughs> yeah no doubt <laughs> right I'm, do I'm doing it from scratch on a fresh Amazon account so uh, yeah <laughs> all right so well here it is right here so I'm going to move that over there I'm going to move this over here and so if we have a lot of screaming and stuff, a bunch of you have been taking notes already, or like bring out your notebooks, which is great. Uh, so Jacob, you're ready to go. Uh, and you're logged mm -hmm. into Amazon. So, and then, uh, um, cool. All right. Uh, and, and for everyone who's here, we're not just going to cut this off the top of the hour. This is done when it's done. This video will get a little bit more treatment and polish, and we'll make sure that it makes it up on YouTube appropriately. So this is going to be recorded and uh, cleaned up a little bit. And any, any cuss words will be sanitized out because of malfunctions and stuff, right? So, Hopefully this will not elicit swearing. <laughs> All right. Hoping. All right. Here we go. <laughs> um, and just... Uh, so Oregon, I'm going to open with this because it's a really good question. Uh, Oregon Dean in Discord asked, uh, is this sort of FileMaker server for Linux um, essentially the same as, you know, the, the FileMaker cloud product that people might be familiar with? Um, it is true that is probably where this work came from uh, within Claris, but they're not quite the same. Um, one of the major differences, and we won't need to deal with it today, I don't think, um, but just one that stands out is one of the ways where that was a little more of a bubble wrapped product FileMaker Cloud was, uh, is we didn't have access to, to some of the command line tools like FMS admin. 
um, that can you can generate your SSL certificates with that, change some of the settings on the server and things like that. Um, so one, we have full access to that because this is a FileMaker server. Um, and on FileMaker Cloud, you do not have full access to that. It just, they, they neutered it or, or whatever. It didn't do anything. So you could run your commands all you wanted and nothing would happen. Um, yes, same engines. He's asking host and licensing is different, but same engines, yes. It is the same, uh, yeah, the same database engine. So um, one thing, I'm just gonna start out kind of at the top here. One thing to know, uh, if you are super amazingly excited about being on the latest version of absolutely everything, uh, you will not be able to do that here. Um, CentOS, uh, which is just a flavor of Linux, if you guys are, if you have heard of Red Hat, for example, um, CentOS is basically the, the, the not licensed version. It stands for Community Enterprise Operating System. It's Red Hat Linux, but without the Red Hat and the uh, math it usually comes with that. Um, if you're a really giant business, uh, you, you might actually use or like Red Hat and uh, the support contract that comes with it. And no, I have no complaints there. It's just, it, they're expensive and that's why. Um, so this is basically the free version of it. Um, and so all they do is swap out the names and the branding and that kind of stuff and say, you know, go for it, you're on your own. Um, and so one thing you might note is that CentOS 8 point whatever is out currently. Um, and so uh, we can't use that. Uh, FileMaker server for Linux at present does not support it. Um, and so sort of the short version of all of that is you're, if you're going to try and run this on CentOS 8, it's not officially supported yet. Um, I don't, I have no information past any of you as to when that might happen or if it will happen. Um, and so you're going to be using the, the CentOS Linux 7 images. Um, I've opened this up on my uh, browser here because this page, and I'm going to paste it into Discord, and then people can paste it elsewhere. Um, this has links to the official Amazon images for CentOS, um, which makes it a lot easier to find them, basically. Um, because if you go searching, uh, which is how I started this uh, inside of the Amazon Marketplace, it's honestly a little difficult to identify which exactly, which one you're actually looking for, because there's a bunch of stuff that's based on CentOS um, or uses it as a basis for some application server or, you know, whatever. Um, so I think we're going to do this test in Oregon. Um, and so I'm going to pick this one right here, which is CentOS Linux 7 for US West 2. Um, and I'm just going to click the, the deploy link because that'll pop me over to where I need to be um, on Amazon. It puts me into the, what's called the, the instant, the launch wizard, um, or the instance launch wizard. Um, so I'm just going to pick an instance size here. We're going to do a T3 large because that's tons of horsepower. The smallest you can absolutely get away with is a medium, but don't use that for uh, any, if you're like 10 users or more, you need to be on a large um, is, what, is usually what we tell people, unless everybody's going to be on WebDirect and then you might want to be on a large anyway, so because it needs more horsepower. Um, but we're going to do a T3 large for the demo today. We're going to do configure instance. Um, we're only launching one instance. We're going to have everything on auto because I don't particularly care. You guys might have settings here. Um, some of this network stuff matters. We'll see if we run into any issues because I'm just picking the picking the defaults here. Um, yep, so I um, it comes with a, a hard drive of 8 gigs. Uh, you're probably going to want a bigger hard drive than that. Just <laughs> um, I'm gonna set it to 100. That's a random number. It doesn't really matter. Um, just for just for demo purposes, basically. Um, I think we've talked about on other streams, kind of sizing for backups and that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm not gonna address too much of that today. I don't need any tags. Um, tags are a really useful thing that you can do in Amazon to um, tag instances, so you can set like policies within Amazon that do certain things based on how machines are tagged. Um, which is a really useful um, kind of feature. All right, yeah, waiting for the beach balling to stop. All right, so uh, this is the all important, uh, you might call it the firewall. Uh, Amazon calls this a security group. So obviously we are going to need SSH, which is how you are gonna be interacting with this system. Um, I am gonna add the required ports here for FileMaker, so we're going to want HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, if you guys remember, there will also be a port 
file, uh, oh, I want the custom TCP. Um, and we're going to do port 5003, and I'm just going to pick the same one. Um, and then the final one that we'll want is uh, the admin console, which is on, I guess that'll be custom TCP. It's on port 16,000. So that will allow TCP is, uh, sorry, port 22 is SSH, which is the command line that we're going to use to talk to the machine after this. I suppose I could make all of these exactly the same. Um, the, the colon colon slash zeros for IPv6, which in this particular case probably doesn't apply, but still. Um, so, and then HTTP, again, that's your container data. Um, and then 80 versus 443 is for no SSL certificate or SSL certificate. Obviously, we're probably going to see the server in both states. Um, 5003 is the standard FileMaker server data port, and 16000 is how you get to the admin console, um, which will be very critical after this thing comes back up um, because you will need it to uh, install the SSL certificate if you're not going to do that on the command line somehow, uh, or uh, put the license certificate, which you can actually see probably in the bottom of my window here because um, I, I downloaded ours earlier. Um, so we're going to do review and launch. And yes, our security group is open to the world. That's correct. Uh, we have AMI details, which is a CentOS 7.8, which is the supported version by FileMaker Server. We're going to launch a T3 large. Uh, we've poked some holes in our firewall here. And that all looks great. Um, we're going to do launch. So this is the one, yes, we don't have any key pairs. So this is one thing, you, one checkpoint that you'll have. If you have keys already, there will be, you could choose an existing pair and it would give you a list. Um, I'm gonna create a new one for this, for the purposes of this demonstration, also because we don't have any currently. Um, don't lose this uh, like under any circumstances. Uh, so for Windows servers, you really only need this the very first time because you'll take it to your admin con or to the to Amazon console, which is in the background here. Um, and you can say, give me the Windows password and, and you give it that key and it will decrypt the Windows password and give it to you, like the, the, the Windows administrator password for a Windows machine on, on Amazon. For Linux, uh, you're gonna use this key to log into the server. So if you lose it, you don't have access to your server anymore unless you have built some other way to get into it. And since we're starting this up, um, we're not gonna have that. So we're gonna do I'm just going to name it RCC so, Linux demo. So I want to point out once again that this is one of those things you don't lose. You stick it in five places so you don't lose it. Um, um, I know yep. people never say write down your Mac. What happens is people get these really important passwords, and they're like, oh, my God, you can't share it with anyone. And then they and then they write it down in like one tiny spot on some inside of some safe wall, and they forget about it, and they lose access to their server. So I can't tell you. The chances of someone breaking into your house and stealing your post-it notes are pretty low. Put it on a post-it note, put it a couple different places. Um, the flip side, of course, is not using any security. That's bad. You can't really do that here. But this is one of those things you just don't want to screw this up. And so uh, uh, people lose this. Uh, and, then, and, there, and you can't call Amazon uh, to get it back. Hey, you can give them the biggest sob story. You know, there's the nuns are going to die, the children are going to die, the homeless people won't have any food, we're all going to go to hell in the handbasket if I don't get this. They can't give it to you. It's a mechanical impossibility, right, Jacob? Yep, correct. Okay, so there we go. And, that, and that's, what, that's what they warn you about right here. So um, if you, you know, lose something like this, uh, Amazon will hopefully maybe offer to delete the resources, which is to say your server from your account for you. <laughs> yeah, that's all they will do. You don't have access to it anymore, and so it's like, well, that's cool. Um, try again <laughs> next week. Um, it's it's a point past which you're not you're not yeah, going to do there's, anything. There's no, so we're going to hit launch here, so we can get this thing going. And Amazon will walk through all these steps, and it gives you some little output, uh, and we'll be able to monitor some of the information here. The main thing I have to we have to go look at is we're gonna learn here uh, what the IP address of the server is because I don't know what it is ahead of time. Now, are you using an Elastic IP here? Or what are you doing? Um, we probably don't have one yet, actually. So, um, what and so what those are is you, you would probably think of them as the static IP, basically. Um, although humorously, Elastic IP and static IP are kind of 
different <laughs> opposing words yeah. yeah opposing words in some sense um they're, they're elastic for reasons that make sense with inside of amazon basically you can take them and like have you can have one ip on the front and then multiple machines behind it um inside the little bubble up in amazon um and so that's why they're elastic because you can do their but program but it's assigned you to you up. it's assigned to you which makes it Correct. basically static effectively yeah, yeah. So and and so and so for the purposes of something like this that it's basically it's your static ip that's what it is for you okay. um and so we have not deployed one of those yet i'm gonna drag this thing down so all right so that thing says it's running the status checks aren't done yet um what we want to see is where's the address there it is. All right, so it did automatically assign an address to the server. Perfect. But as you can see in that column right there, there is no Elastic IP associated with the server. What that means is if you ever, so if you just restart the instance, like your, you know, sudo reboot or, or the equivalent of, you know, hitting the power button on Windows and restarting it or something, um, you'll come back up on the same address. That's fine. There's no problem. If you ever stop the server, which is to say, like, shut it down, even for, you know, seconds and immediately boot it back up again, it doesn't matter. Um, you will lose that IP, you will have a new one. So you have to be aware of that. And an Elastic IP solves that problem because when you, you get an Elastic IP and then you put it on the machine, once you do that, it's stuck. Um, you have the one IP for the machine, you can reboot it, you can shut it off, you can do whatever. It'll always come back up again on that IP. It's, it's kind of what you're thinking of. But machines on Amazon don't necessarily come set up that way by default. Um, and the reason for that is because a lot of people in Amazon are running stuff inside little bubbles. They don't need to be accessed out on the open internet. They're you know talking inside to their little other friend machines. Um, and so there's, there's no real reason for them to have a... Uh, a fully, you know, publicly accessible external IP or whatever. So, yeah, that's a, this is a separate thing you pay for. It's not much money, but they uh, they kind of limit the number you can get, and you have to specifically request it and pay for it. Was it five dollars a month or something or whatever? You know, um, if you no, they're free if it's on a machine and the machine's running. Okay. Um, but if you, for example, uh, which we did, and I just saw fix this on one of our accounts, um, if you set up a server, you you know shut down and kill the server later, and you didn't get rid of the Elastic IP when you did that, um, which doesn't, it usually happens automatically, or there's a checkbox that you can check to make it, you know, you destroy the machine or terminate them is what the term is, um, and then it just it goes away. It takes all the hard drives with it. It you know kind of blows everything out. Um, there's an there's an uh, you can choose not to get rid of the elastic IP at that time. Um, if you do that uh, and it and you don't take it and attach it to another server, you'll get charged. Yeah, uh, and apparently it's about three dollars and seventy two cents a month. Mm, okay. So there we go. I learned that. I learned that today. So um, for this demo, I'm I guess we can show putting an elastic IP on this. Uh, if it would no. take long to do it, just stick it on there. Um, so we're going to allocate an IP. Um, so Amazon's really like kind of regimented about everything. So we have to allocate an IP. Um, there's a bunch of options here. If you guys get super interested in networking, you can go read about them all. I'm just going to do this really fast. Um, we allocate it, which means it assigns whatever this IP is, which it's apparently 52 dot whatever that is right there. Um, assigns it to our account and then we're going to associate it which is the second step of this um, and so you, you allocate it it assigns it to your Amazon account but it's not attached to a machine yet when you associate the IP you're you're attaching it to uh, they call it an instance but the actual machine it's Amazon. the virtual server yeah the AEC2 mm -hmm. virtual instance yeah the virtual yeah Questions from okay. I'm not. I'm watching Discord. I've been ignoring YouTube and uh, Twitch. I guess I should watch this. Peter Boyce. Ah, see, I'm ignoring you, Peter. I'm really bad. Uh, oh yeah, Peter said yeah. We should. You should use passwords from a service like Let's Let Last Pass or something like that. Some sort of online service that helps you with the password management. Could be. Um, I'm not sure if they store keys though. Key is a text file, right? A little text no. file. No. Yeah, that that won't work for this scenario. Um, keys in some ways are superior to passwords. They're harder because if you lose them, you're effed. Um, but <laughs> like, there's there's no you you can't do anything with that afterwards. Um, but it means that you don't have to remember a password. You don't have to get a software service to remember a password. 
um, anything like that. And so I'm going to show just about the time this thing gets done here. I'm trying to get back to my, my dashboard so I can go look at my machine and make sure everything's ready to go. Um, once it is, we're going to immediately log in and I will show you guys logging in with the key. Um, and so I'm not going to type a, a user password at any point during this. Um, the only the only credential I'll actually have that's like a username and password for this um, demo actually is going to be the admin console for FileMaker Server. So that's the only time we're going to need to like do anything with with passwords. Passwords. All right, two checks. Awesome. No alarms. We have our Elastic IP. Beautiful. So we're going to pop up our terminal. Ooh, I can see through the terminal. That's awesome. You can see the IP in the background. That'll make it a lot easier to type. <laughs> um, cool. So let's see where RCC Linux demo. That's what I have to do. So um, I'm going to do SSH. So what I am doing here is I'm going to log into the server on SSH. Um, so like I said, we're going to log in using the key that we downloaded earlier um, as the password, which is in that, that key file is called rccLinuxDemo.pem, which should be in my downloads directory. So actually, I'm going to um, SSHI, and it'll be, and we'll go downloads, and it'll be RCC Linux demo. So what I've done there is I'm telling SSH, so the I, and those are called switches. The I switch says, uh, what is your identity file? Um, and so we're going to, our, our identity in this scenario is that uh, Linux key, basically. Um, and so then we're going to use the username, which by default on CentOS machines is CentOS. That's uh, not like a super secret thing. It is how the Amazon images work, basically. Um, just like if you ever um, went on Amazon and you um, set up an Ubuntu server, you would at least by default be logging in as Ubuntu at your IP address. Um, so I'm going to type in RIP 12.13.106. And it's going to ask me if I trust the key. Uh, and we're going to say yes, why not? Because I've never seen this key before, and I'll just assume it's good. And what is it complaining about? Ah, yes. So we have to change the permissions on our key. Um, this is a small detail most people don't really care about. Um, but basically, SSH as a program tries to keep you from shooting yourself in the foot. For example, having your private keys uh, accessible to everybody on the computer. Currently it is, and so it's mad at me. Um, and the way that it gets mad at me is to tell me that I have messed up and uh, that I need to like fix that because other people on my computer, of course I'm the only person that uses my computer, so in this scenario it doesn't really matter. Um, but other people on my computer could theoretically access that. Um, I have to type the command correctly. What's the name of the file? Oh, RCC Linux. I'm sorry, I'm not in the right directory. That'll fix it. So if I run my, oh, by the way, tip on terminal or any other kind of command line like this, if you hit the up arrow, uh, it'll go to your previous commands um, in opposite order, like backwards. So we'll do that, and now it just logged in. So we are now connected to our fresh uh, T3 large running CentOS 7.8, um, and now comes the exciting part. So um, I'm going to grab the directions actually, uh, and so what I ended up what I ended up following to do this for RCCs um, is they have posted Claris has posted on their site the Actually, it's like the it's the old developer preview directions, um, but I think that was like people ran into issues or with the preview software. But this was their aspirational version of how it's supposed to work, um, and so we're, I'm just going to follow it basically. Uh, so two pieces of software that we will want to have on this server uh, is wget and unzip. Um, wget is a way to fetch like files over the web and other different protocols onto a Linux machine. Um, and then unzip kind of does what it sounds like. Uh, it can take a zip file and uh, spit it out for you. Um, TK55678 asks in Discord, if Amazon supports FIDO2 U2F keys, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that they are trying to force me to put an SMS code on it. 
Um, I hope that they support those keys if they don't currently. Um, I know that if you have a high value account, they will send you a token, but I believe it's like a, an Amazon specific token. Yeah, I think. You mean like a hardware token? token? Yeah, correct. Wow, um, okay. Um, yeah, Google does the same thing actually. We can, I think we can send them 50 bucks or something like that and whatever the super admin account is for our, for your like Google stuff, do, Google domain stuff, um, they'll, they'll turn on all the, all the stuff, all the security crap for you. Yeah. Um, and, and give you a token and you can't get in without the token and all yeah. that stuff. There's a lot so. to, there's a lot to be said for something simple like that. It used to be people thought that was complicated, but you know, you have enough bad things happen to you. So pseudo yum update. What is that? So uh, I'm going to be really good here. And before we even go install wget or unzip, I'm going to update the system. And so what this has done is it has pulled down all the updates that are available. Uh, and it's asking me if what it has just chosen to do is OK. And I'm just going to say yes. So you're saying that, that there was an image that Amazon gave us. We took, we'd used the image to build the instance. But the image is slightly or somewhat out of date. And so we're patched. Mm -hmm. So we're running an auto update to patch the image that we already had yeah. just taken. It's, it's just like an operating system update somewhere yeah. else. The difference is, uh, I'm going to reboot it anyway, actually, because it takes about seven seconds. But um, but on Linux, you can just pull, most of the time, you can just pull this stuff down uh, and be done. So okay. the extremely exciting part, watching progress bars. Okay. Um, and actually, that that's that's what the, the installation later for FileMaker Server is. Um, you guys will laugh because it'll take about once we actually get to the point where we can do that, the whole install takes about four minutes or five, maybe. Um, okay. It pulls it pulls a whole bunch of stuff down onto the server and configures it all up and whatever. And we'll see if it breaks the way that it did the, when I did it the first time. I mentioned it in the stream yesterday, and I'll mention it here for posterity. Um, it it seems like when you install FileMaker Server for Linux, um, it doesn't always like the, the web server portions, which you might think of WebDirect or container data and thumbnails and stuff, that stuff doesn't seem to always come up reliably after the installation happens. Um, and so you can try and figure out how to do that or their recommendation is just reboot the system. Claris, which, um, Claris is printed recommendation says reboot the system. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, problem, so, there you go. All right. Yep. All right, so is this um, done? It says 6464. 64. Was that done, or what's it doing? It's waiting. Um, it's doing cleanup stuff. Uh, yum is the, just a little background while we're staring at this. Yum is the, the so Linux has package managers. Um, Windows, you don't really deal with this. Mac, you don't really deal with it. But Linux has a centralized software distribution system. And there, there's some different ones that exist um, based on the Linux or Unix that you're using. Um, I can name a bunch of them, but you, you guys can go look up some of that stuff. Debs, it uses Debs for uh, um, uh, Deb, Deb packages for Debian or Ubuntu based systems, and then RPMs like Red Hat Package Manager, that's what it stands for, um, for CentOS, Red Hat, um, things based on that. Um, and so for each of those systems, for example, there's then a package manager. So the Ubuntu system, systems and Debian and whatever, they have what's called apt, A-P-T, uh, and then Red Hat and things based on it have uh, yum. Yeah. Question, what size instance did you select here? I missed that at the beginning when you were doing that. I assume you did that. Uh, I did a T3 large. Oh, okay. Good. So this has got plenty of horsepower. This would run uh, 20, 30 people real easily, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, dual core, um, lots of credits because it's a T3. No, t wait, wait, t wait, wait, t is this the size of our main corporate server? T3. Large? No, it's one one down. We're an X large. Oh, extra large because we have four cores, right? Yes. Now, yep. okay. So then this is two that, cores. That's again. when it jumps from two cores to four cores. Got yeah. It. So so basically, like, so you, so for a medium, like the 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 differences most people look at between like a medium and a large is the RAM because four gigs to eight gigs is frankly a lot of breathing room yeah. um, these days. Uh, it it may still be insufficient depending on your user count, but it's a lot of breathing room. Um, but the other big thing that that gives you from a T3 medium to a T3 large, for example, is because the T series 
which is like there used to be a T1 forever ago, T2 and T3 right. are currently around. Um, they use a credit-based system. And so generally you're never going to run out of credits unless you're doing something wild for a very long time. We, we um, spent a lot of time talking about this uh, in our paid video course. So people should go watch that yep. out of our yep. paid course. In our It's in the deployment section of videos we talk about. Yeah, we have, a whole, we have look, a whole video for that. I spent five videos about an hour going beating the hell out of the whole idea with the T's and what it would take to run them down. It's like discharging your battery, right? So... Um, it's almost impossible to do with FileMaker without really crashing the server. It's, uh, I think it's designed for people who are doing video encoding and processes that where you run 100% on the processor and it's still normal, right? But if you run 100% yeah. on a FileMaker server, the users are already screaming at you and calling your phone number because you're already they're already unresponsive, right? So. Yep. Yep. And so you, you'd pick a different instance type in Amazon if you were trying to do that. So. Anyway, you'd, you'd probably end up with like an M5 or something like that because those are more closer to what you might think of as like a dedicated server. They're not, they're still not because there, there is a concept of a dedicated server in Amazon. Um, they're very expensive, frankly. So, um, but yeah. they actually, but that's, they dedicate, there's no sharing, they dedicate hardware to you. So, yeah, okay, wow. Um, all right, so the two things that I just did uh, while we were going through that is I installed wget and unzip uh, as they suggest. Um, and then, so I'm actually not going to do this um, because getting files up to and onto the server is frankly annoying. Um, I can show you guys how to do it, but it's much easier if you basically, because FileMaker server at this point, when you install it, it's always going to be a trial if you don't give it licensing. It's like a 45 day trial, right? Um, and so if you just install it as a trial and then put the licensing in later, it works great. Okay. Uh, and I find that to just frankly be much easier than trying to figure out how to get files up on the server. Um, if you guys want to go look it up, uh, the program or the command that you're looking for is going to be SCP. Um, if you're on Mac, that won't be an issue because you have it. If you're on Linux, like you're on your own computer, uh, you also will have no problem because you have it. If you're on Windows, uh, good luck or go install the I assume the I assume the Linux system that comes with or that comes in Windows 10 now probably does that, um, but I don't I don't know I haven't played around with it to be honest. Um, so what we're gonna do is um, we're not gonna touch any of that. So what we need to do is install the FileMaker server. So we're gonna go over here to our command line. Um, we're gonna Windows, use w he says uh, Dennis Chow says Win SCP works well. So yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, Win I, SCP works well. That's a good. Um, Dennis, is that a, auto install in Windows 10, or is that an extra install? That's a. It's a third party open source. Yeah, it is. It is third party. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's it's lovely. I've I've used it for 15 years. Um, it it uh, provides a kind of a file browser like the old FTP clients or something ah, okay. sort of interface, but it does. Um, uh, SSH file transfers and stuff like that. Now, um, but that's if we're trying to piece this thing together in a license immediate. I mean, the, instead we're just going to do a trial. Out of the box. Yeah, yeah. We, I'm gonna, trial. We're going to pretend this is a trial. Yeah. Okay. And then you'd put your license in after the fact, which would be trivial, I'm sure. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so for this, what I'm going to do is I'm I'm copying and pasting this link here. This is Claris's download link. I pulled this off of our licensing page uh, about 10 minutes before the stream started. And so this is just going to download the zip file onto the server. We're going to unzip it when it's done, um, and then run the. So you, run every the everyone there, you can steal this link, but it's not. It's it's basically without the license. This is the current trial, right? So the mm -hmm. current, yeah. current, a current clean download. So what yeah. is the and file? I, I could. Sorry. Oh, oh, go ahead. That's fine. I was just saying, I, I could pull it. We have links for this too that we give out to our customers. This is just the one that comes directly from Claris, and I figure that's probably the best for the demo. Okay, I got a question. So this is just very important. So it says FMS 19.1.2 build 234. Normally mm -hmm. we'd be able to tell it was Mac or Windows. So how do we know what platform that it just look? We can't based upon just because it. Oh, frankly, only because it's a zip, which doesn't okay. tell you anything. But that's yeah. Um, so the, the Windows one is FMS. It's the exact same things, but it's .exe. The Mac is .dmg, and the Linux is .zip. That's the only uh, file okay. name difference. As of 19.1.2 specifically, that's, they don't even put the you know x64 or, or whatever type stuff in the file name. So. Yep, yep. All right, moving along. Unzip it. There we go. You'll ah. see this. It, 
There it is. Yeah. There's your there's your unzip. Uh, it inflates. That's what it's called. It inflates all the files. Um, yep, because they were they were crunched down, and you're you're blowing them back up again. Um, and so this is this from the documentation. This is the command that we're going to be hitting right here. Um, I'm going to leave the Y off, but that's uh, if they they show it in brackets. So kind of explaining this command right here, number two on this document. We'll we'll link this in one of the descriptions too. Um, which I think I can let me paste this link into Discord for everybody. And you guys can copy it. Um, so. What, that, what this command does is sudo, which means I need to be an admin, yum, which as I said earlier is the package manager, that's like the program name, uh, install is what we're gonna do, and the name of course is the name of the software or the file that we're gonna install. So this is gonna be that, as you can see on our little command line over here. Oops, sorry, I didn't click correctly. We can't see the command line. So did you already this do step our... three, the la la whatever thing on there? The ls la right there, step three that, one? No, because it you don't need to. So if I do that, what it's going to do is it's going to show me the files that are in the directory. Mm -hmm. They they do that because people, uh, if you think about it, when you're trying to do like an OODA loop, you want to orient and then decide I'm going to install and then act on that. Okay. Um, a lot of people habitually will type ls or things like that before they go to do something just to remember exactly where they are and what they're doing got basically it. got it it's it's the computer version of the second o on an ooda loop <laughs> um so we're going to sudo yum install and then we're going to do file maker and so what i'm doing there if you see it jumps all the way to the end with the whole file name uh if you get so for example, uh, there's nothing else in this folder named FileMaker. So I can do F-I-L, which you can see from the list, there's nothing else that starts with that. If I hit the tab key, it completes it for me. Oh, nice. I don't have to do anything. Um, so you're using the yum other, on the RPM, but then what about the zip? We're gonna do that separately, or is that a two-part? We, we unzipped it already. So oh, we this, did. These, yeah, these that's files right, came that's out right. of the zip. That's right, so yep. then, then, so and then. It's, it's, it's just like what happens when you run the that first exe mm. when you're installing it on a server for example or a yep. dmg they have a they have a pkg file yep, yep, yep. um it comes with the licensing it comes with a readme uh and your assisted install.txt uh which right. is kind of oriented differently when it's on mac and windows but that's you can see that listed here yep. that's it just popped all those things out for you okay so. got it as you've all you can tell i'm not much of a linux person so this is good so all right keep going and it's going to do a whole bunch of stuff and it has asked me, do I want to install 1.6 gigabytes of stuff? Uh, and it's going to add 139 pieces of software to my system. Um, and yeah. I, we're going to blindly say yes. <laughs> yeah. We want all of it. Oh, yeah, that brings up a good point, right? Uh, because you direct and doing things like that, you're limited to the fonts that are on the server. It looks like it just added some fonts. It right? will pull all of them down for you, yes. What's all, Okay, but what's all of them? when you say that uh all of the ones that claris thinks that you need okay okay well i could have answered that winnie the pooh right yes 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 so, so, so <laughs> yes it's time for some i don't know what the list is we can we can get the list if you want there's 140 packages here so oh. um yeah because because sometimes like you get like on a windows server and it doesn't have a lot of fonts and then people are trying to reprint these reports and stuff and it's doing mm -hmm. font substitution and they're complaining because they have i got all these fonts on my pc and it looks like dog doo-doo and it's because your pc is not providing the fonts the fonts are coming from the server because you're using a web browser application you're not <laughs> you're not locally on pro they're on WebDirect, right so anyway yep yep all right confirm well, and, yep and so we're gonna this is the license agreement so we're gonna agree is that it's gonna do stuff Oh, you, uh, it took an A. I thought it was West, yes Ooh, or no. Oh, it failed. Nice. Why did it fail? Um, did you put the right thing in? Because it was, it, was, it was Y or no, not A. It was not an answer. Oh, oops. On your license of key. Good catch. See, I can operate a computer. I promise everybody. Well, I'm not sure that was it. It still went forward, so... Try it again. Oh, but it fa it failed the it no because it failed the most critical thing, which is if you don't agree to the licensing agreement, it just fails the install. Oh, okay. So that was my bad. I should have hit Y. So Dude. um, here's the first choice. You guys might remember this from the install. You usually have to pick if you're installing a FileMaker server or a WebDirect worker. Okay, um, stop. 
this is fatherly advice unless you really we talked about web direct workers yesterday but unless yep. you really know what a web direct worker is and or you have over a hundred people using your web direct application right then you need to say no it's not a web direct use you're not going to use a web direct worker it's a file one, maker server it's yeah. a single installation on FileMaker server i highly recommend and then the second question it's going to ask us, which might also seem familiar from the regular installer, is what is our admin console the credential going to be? And so this is going to be the username, and I'm going to use the most secure thing ever. We're going to use admin and password. Mm -hmm. uh, please, dear Lord, use something more secure <laughs> on your own systems. Uh, we're going to create a pin. Okay. And then that's it. And so it's going to install all of the prerequisite software for us. Um, and we're going to sit here and stare at it and smile. Uh, David Angel asked, what is the temp folder for FileMaker server on Linux? Um, I we're think like other things, it's going to be the temp directory on Linux. Um, buried there's, there's down other... in there. Yeah, buried down in there. Yeah, yeah well, because there's, there's other ones, for example, like there's a temp for container data uploads and stuff that's separate. Um, there's like multiple different temp directories I can think of. The generic one is just slash TMP. Um, yeah, that's what TK up, just said. No, no. Yeah. It'll, uh, in, in general, the, the like global or, you know, system wide temp directory basically is slash TMP on most Linux systems, Linux and Unix systems. Install default license certificate. Nice. There's your trial. And it's going to try and reload. Uh, what it is currently doing is, um, if you guys remember when you install FileMaker Server, or uh, I think it also comes with Pro, um, it installs, what's the software name Apple makes it? It does MDNS. Is that the um, Bonjour thing, or is that something? Bonjour, else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, it failed. What did it say? Failed to... Where's the failed? Failed to oh, it, oh, it start... Oh, so it failed, and then... Fire. installed and it still said complete okay great i love it um so we so should this, probably this, this is where we do our restart right yes correct yeah and i'm going to demonstrate that so because because i literally i had somebody email in about it um we're going to go over here i'm going to go to my instances we're going to copy this elastic ip yeah. I'm paste it and it's probably going to fail i'm going to do something weird Ooh. Mm, kind of got there it worked Let's see if we get an admin console. So I have to do HTTPS, and it won't have a real SSL certificate. So it's going to give me this, as always. And we're going to do advanced. And, and we're going to override. Yeah. Yep. And we're going to override. Are you in, are you in wanna... Chrome right now? Chromium or Chrome? I am. Yeah. Okay, Chrome does not fight you nearly as much as Safari does. Safari so... makes. Yeah, I don't. So, sometimes you can't even bypass on the Safari at all. Yep. Well, Ooh, crap! So it's it's kind of working. I'm still gonna reboot it. Yeah, yeah. I'm still gonna reboot it just to just to get everything ironed out. Um, but for example, if you came to this and it said you know connection refused or connection failed or something like that, just reboot it. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to do that because I think that's a good um, because they were advising it in a bunch of cases where the install fails. I think we got lucky because, like I said, when when I did this for RCC has our own like test Linux server now. Um, when I did it, this totally failed. Um, yeah. And you couldn't you couldn't touch the admin console or any of this stuff. So um, just as a as a demo for how to do that, you do sudo and then reboot, and that's it. Um, but you're already connected to that server. Yeah, yeah, because you're you're uh, that's what you're talking to. Yeah, I got it. All right. Yeah, yeah, correct. If you do sudo reboot on your own. For example, if you're on a Mac like mine, uh, that would end our stream rather quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was like, uh, wait a minute, make sure you target the right thing. It's like, poof, Jacob yeah. disappeared. <laughs> He just uh, rebooted himself, yeah. So. Yep, yep. And that's that's exactly what that would do. Uh, because reboot is a very quick command, it would emergency exit all of my applications, including the database uh, properly on server? It does, yeah. Oh. Um, and it seems to be fairly reliable about that. So I, I, as always, still have questions about the safety of that. In this particular case, the only thing, of course, there's no clients on the server at all. Um, and the only database on there, so I don't even care about it, is, the, is that sample database. Um, I, what I don't know and what I can't tell you is I, I probably wouldn't endorse just doing that on a system with users on it um, because 
FileMaker Server can take time to boot all the clients off and then safely close the databases. That can take a minute. Um, and things like a pseudo reboot, uh, they'll wait, but not forever. And so um, it's, it's a better practice if you can to go and uh, close out the databases or even if you want to be fancy about it manually kick all the users and then close the databases what, um, we covered a slide on Monday about this would the USR kill the number? user yeah the, the pseudo kill user one um, that is the if you for example if you get yourself up a creek and you've lost your paddle um, and you can't do what I just said which is go to the admin console and start you know shutting stuff down and that kind of thing if that's not if that's basically that's the issue is that you can't do that um, there there is a there is a way on Linux for you to manually tell the filemaker server process to boot everybody and emergency close its databases um, you can tell it how to do that on Mac and on Linux now you can't do it on Windows um, Claire says for security reasons so fine but yeah so if you lose access to this web interface you can come over here to, if you can get into the command line once again you need your little key file for that and then you could issue your user Oop. kill. Connection refused. It's not ready yet. Ah, I see. So would you type again? Just to, to initiate. I just hit the up arrow, and so it brings me the old command uh, back up. Oh, here. there it is. So that's the uh, SSH. So the, the server's telling me connection refused. Usually, what that means is that. Um, because if you think about how a computer boots up, it comes up, the hardware turns on, your CPU things initialize, but and then you go into the operating system, but you haven't launched the programs that yeah. might run on the server yet. Yeah. And so one of the things that launches at the end is SSH, which is what we're trying to communicate over. So if that's not up yet, the server will be there and it will respond to your entreatise that you would like to talk to its SSH server, uh, but that's not running yet. And so it's going to tell you no. And so it refuses, actually. That's actually what it's called. <laughs> Do that, and we're in. Cool. So now it's back. Yay. So it, yeah, so now it's back up again. Uh, I'm going to use COP, and we're going to see how much memory are we using. Um, so we have almost 8 gigs total. That's what that is, 79, yeah. whatever it is, 7.9 gigs. Um, we have that free, so we're using... 800 and whatever, 50 Six. megabytes or whatever, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so we need we need to generally increase the cache size because it's at its default setting, right, right now? Correct, yeah. Um, so we're going to reload. Yeah, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to apply licensing to this, actually. Um, so we have not done any setup on this at all, so this is a brand new system. Um, so you guys will see the uh, lovely welcome welcome screen that you always get first time you set up a FileMaker server asking you about your SSL certificates. Um, in this case, I'm going to use the default certificate, mostly because it doesn't matter for the purpose of the demo, um, and it's going to warn me because that's a terrible idea. And we're going to accept the risk of people reading our data off the wire. We should like to avoid that. Um, and bam, you're in. Okay. And well, so as you can see here, we have our nice little kind of 45-day trial. Yep. Um, we're going to immediately go over to administration. We're going to see trial, da, 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 all that stuff. We're going to import our license certificate. Um, doo, doo, doo. Go find it. Yeah, this uh, probably should not be a public address just for fun. So. Now, it's finding it in your browser on your local computer. Got it. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm, this is like on my local computer. So that was my downloads folder, which, uh, as you can tell, has way too much stuff in it. Um, and so we're going to put our organization in there and hit change and it'll think and hey there's our site license with a 25 seats there you go okay so that's licensed um, obviously you know as always you want to add some backups you know go over here and add some backups um, all of the command line stuff I've ever done on other demonstrations um, for example uh, since Richard mentioned it, we'll, we will want to uh, increase the cache size, for example, just as a demo. This stuff all works exactly as you'd expect. Um, so we're going to do set server config cache size. Uh, and this is an eight, a server with 8 gigabytes of RAM. So we're going to take a gig off, so that'll be 7. We're going to divide that by 2. So that'll be 3.5 gigs, which is 3,500 megabytes. 
Okay, and then we have some questions we need to go through on YouTube. So the YouTube people have been really uh, patient. We really appreciate that. So we're going to handle some questions now from them. So you've done there that. There you go. Works okay. exactly like every other platform. So, right. so yeah, Tawa says, I would like to learn how to set up on-prem CentOS OS FileMaker server. Can you show that? Uh, well, you'd have to have your own Linux machine at your mm -hmm. office, and then it would basically be the same process kind of you'd have to have the Linux installed first so yeah that's not that, really what we're gonna be able to that show. would be pretty straightforward um, you can there, there's one thing that was that is different if you're on-premise so I, I don't know if you're intending to use a virtual machine or if you're gonna like get some server hardware and put CentOS on it um, if you do the if you get some server hardware and put CentOS on it you will probably be able to sit at the keyboard um, at the screen of the actual computer in that case um, that may be useful for you because um, you can op you can use the desktop like it has a full desktop environment it looks like Windows or Mac or whatever um, all, all similar applications exist for CentOS um, if you install it out of the box for a server setup like that do note it won't come with a lot um, but you'll have a terminal application and you can do all of the same things that we've just done today um, with a graphical environment so cloud without a number and then sometimes you don't know what they're talking about or they say on-prem so I'm just trying to help with all that so uh, so yeah so Tawa says I uh, thanks I've probably heard of AWS I'm assuming that's a joke he says can someone support CentOS uh, OS in New Zealand okay if you need CentOS OS support in New Zealand in person you need to find an in-person person there to do that if you want us to as someone to support it on the amazon data center in new zealand which i think is in the closest one is probably sydney australia then uh we would be then jacob could help you with that the guy who's here with the broadcast um and then uh andre says uh, they're renting amazon server but this is just a centos server like any else you're like ssh yeah great so answers that question um so jacob question it they're yeah yeah they're going back and forth on the different cache sizes um and what might be right and so i'm giving them our our rule of thumb which is take the system memory divide take by a two. gig off and yeah. then divide it by two yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's a start um, that's a start but once again claire's official recommendation is to start using it using the file with using it with your solution which will be unique to you then watching the cache hits on it the percentage of that jacob can you show just, how to do that over here and just increasing it over time well um, until it's 100 yeah, percent. once your once your cache percentage hit is above 95 percent, then you're good right that's kind I think of the you have to works. turn on which one of these do you have to turn on is it top call statistics i think um uh, probably server statistics too i would think but that's just me i would turn on all that myself i'm gonna make you full screen again would you mind sharing the spreadsheet? Uh, okay. <laughs> they want my spreadsheet because I have a, I have a spreadsheet you can punch all the details into, and it will print the, a projection of the cost for an Amazon server. Oh, I, I, didn't finally, know you built that. I finally built that. Yeah. Well, it it was one of the last things that took forever with bringing new customers onto Amazon was running the numbers again. Well, here's what their database here, is, here's their users, like all that stuff. Here's the and problem so. with that. We've done that before. Mike Wallace years ago did that with us. Mm -hmm. uh, he built the solution. The problem is Amazon prices were always changing and it was a real, if you look at the number of servers that Amazon offers, virtual servers, a eh, ton of servers. The, and you, you could use probably most of them with FileMaker server to be honest with you. So. Um, of which there's probably five or six or ten or twelve great choices in there. Um, the rest of them are somewhat uh, a little different. But yeah, the uh, I uh, it gets overwhelming and the prices are always changing. And the prices, once again, a lot of the pr Amazon pricing are based upon supply and demand. So Amazon puts, say that they're down in Africa, or there's uh, Mumbai, India, or wherever they're at, and they're putting a new data center in, and they put in a hundred racks of servers, and each rack has vertical rack has 10 servers. I don't know if that's accurate. And each rack can hold so many people. And what happens is, is that as people start to use space in that data center, Amazon uses some of that data center for selling its own marketplace stuff, right? That's where it starts. They use it for their own stuff. And then they sell off the excess. If they have a lot of excess, the price comes down. They have a little formula that runs the price down lower and lower. And then as it starts to get bought up, the price certainly slowly goes up and you can do a reservation for a year or two or three years and lock in a price which is great but then in three years you have to renew and the price might be higher or lower depending upon supply and demand if all the servers in the, in the building are full and amazon's trying to build a new building they're going to run that price up could be double 
or more because it's a real, you know, they can and that's what they're going to do. Uh, supply and demand. If there's a ton of unused tap supply, price is going to be lower. So that's the problem with quoting prices because some areas are pretty volatile. Some areas, not so much. You know, United States, East and West, not so much. But some places are pretty volatile because they're newer. There's higher, you know, shuffled demand. Sydney's been around a long time, but Mumbai, India is fairly new. I mean, where the regions are at, right? Yeah. I just pick um, the Northern California region to base the pricing on because getting okay. close is usually good enough for customers. Okay. Um, that's our warning is always you don't pay us, you pay Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to give Amazon yeah. your credit card and we're not involved. So they're going to charge you. Yeah. And so I, I, I do it to give people a feel. The reason I picked NorCal actually is because it's one of the more expensive regions. I don't know if it's the most expensive. Australia might be more, but, um, but it's a good starting point. Basically if they're, I can, I can give a reasonably accurate projection and if they're comfortable with that number, uh, if they'll probably come in under that price actually. And so people aren't mad when they pay less than they're expecting. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's, the, that's the short version. Nobody's ever mad when they pay less than they want. Um, it's also worth noting here. So uh, we actually have, so we don't have web presentation engine, like the XML endpoint and stuff like that here. It looks like they got rid of that. But if you go turn all this stuff on, I'm going to wait for this thing. Um, we actually have WebDirect. It's running. So that part works on Linux. Um, it also comes with the data API and the OData interface, that the new REST interface. I haven't played with that at all. It's over here. You can turn it on. Um, that's a little, that's a, that's a difference. That's one of those things where they imported it from cloud where it's kind of, it's kind of obvious that this thing has a lineage in the FileMaker cloud product because FileMaker cloud is where they introduced the OData adapter. Um, that some, I want to say Tableau is what uses that maybe. Um, it's, you can plug a bunch of other stuff into it, but yeah. Agent Chevy asked a good question that I'm going to call out. So they noticed that up in my browser, uh, I have the the server external IP address, which is 52.12.13.106 for this demo machine. Um, and then they noticed over here on my admin console, the server IP address is 172. Dot whatever. You know, it's not the same at all. It's an internal IP address. So. When you're on Amazon, you are inside of what's called a virtual private cloud. Um, and what that means is it's kind of like your home, it's a little bit like your home network where uh, there's an outside IP and an internal IP. Um, and so FileMaker Server only knows what its internal IP is and Amazon is tasked with the job of figuring out how to get the packets from point A to point B, um, coming in off the internet to the FileMaker Server and back again. Yep, 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 good question. All right, so Nick Hunter's tomorrow, folks. If you have any questions, we're gonna this video will be edited up and carved up, and of course, any unsavory unhappiness that I may have expl expressed along the way will, of course, be summarily removed. Any questions that seem o overly goofy by myself, we'll clean those out too. All right, Jacob, any following guidance about this product? So I, we covered this previously, but this product runs about the same speed as a comparable Mac or Windows server using the same hardware right so mm -hmm. it's within 10 percent generally of the spec charts i've seen depending upon what you're doing so it's basically do you want to use linux the question is who's supporting the server and do they know how to do linux and if the server blew up would they know how to repair and kind of triage it right um, mm -hmm. if all you know is what you saw jacob do here you don't know enough okay i'm not picking on anyone it's a good place to start and learn if you're already a linux person watch this video then you're going to be in business right um, i think that's an important concept if your support people are all windows people those are the people that are going to help you then you need to use windows right the, the benefit to linux is just going to be a little cheaper because you're not paying for the windows license very very important if you're a mac person like me you're double screwed because uh, macs don't run on amazon <laughs> So uh, there you go. It's against, it's against the licensing for the operating system. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I will call out one thing here. So traditionally we are paranoid about backups because you always want backups. You want multiple backups. You want backups in multiple places. You want backups hanging out off the side of the boat and uh, out the wings of the airplane. Um, so uh, obviously we haven't set up any backup schedules here. You, you guys can do that. 
can watch our video course if you're unsure of how to get that done. Um, one main thing I want to call out here, though, is because usually we put backups into an S3 bucket. Um, you might do snapshots if you're doing an on-premise server. That's a, a virtualized one. You can do that at the host level. Um, you can do that here. So, and this is different from the Windows servers. So, um, Linux is meant for situations like this, um, and it has built-in tooling for, for example, Amazon uh, going, "Hey, we're about to do a snapshot," and the whole operating system knows what to do with that information. Um, FileMaker Server doesn't have to do anything. You're, you, when you restore from a snapshot, you are still going to be pulling from a backup, for example. Um, but there's a fairly simple process, uh, which is this other page that I've actually set up. So these are the little keywords that you're going to look for if you're going to try and set up an automatic snapshot-based backup system for a specifically a Linux system on Amazon. Um, it won't work the same way on Windows. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you have to do because the way Windows works. But for Linux, you can just do snapshots like this. Um, and as always, the databases on that are live and open on the server, throw them away. Do not use them, period. Um, they won't have been closed for this process. Uh, and I don't think FileMaker server pauses or anything like that during it. So you you won't have good backups as a short version. So you're going to restore from your, your hourly or, or whatever you set up. Um, couple questions. We're trying to wind this down, but there are a couple questions here. M. Johnson asked a question. Looks like our cache size set to default 512. Not sure how to see what it's doing. Um, I assume you mean what the cache hit percentages and stuff like that are. You have to turn on the statistics, and sorry, I actually don't know which um, one of the statistics you have to turn on, but you have to turn on one of the server st statistics collection things, um, and then go look at the logs. And they have a they have a document on how to do that, um, specifically on their their engineering blog. Uh, which I you're, happen to have one marked. Of, one of the telemetry points that ca they catch is, is cash hit percentage. So it's the amount of when someone's trying to do something, they're finding the, the, the important bits of data in RAM or they have to go to the hard drive. And so you want that percentage to be really high getting it out of RAM, which is great. So um, it's the top. Yeah, they, they per I think it is, yeah. They pretty much tell you to basically keep raising the – the cache size, like looking at it, raising the cache size, looking at it, raising the cache size until you get, like, if you're above 90 to 95%, okay, you're doing fine. Um, yeah, you'd have to go down the down this page and look for that, but that it explains that to you down here. So, uh, but that's kind of, that's not a new thing that's been around for a long time. Some people leave it default setting and then they wonder why it's things kind of slow and don't scale very well. You really have to run it. Oh, I just saw it there a second ago. Oops, sorry. It took a second there, and it went there, and then it went down. Do, 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 do. All right, well, if you have... Qu yeah, it was... Uh, do a search for 512 or something. I don't know if you could be in there. Uh, oh, there it is. There it is. Right Cash there. hit percent yeah. and stats dot log. So stats you have to turn log. on not top call, but the other one. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's not top call. Top call is the one where it tells you what the top things that people are doing. As they, uh, that's a test question on the certification test. Configuration and go to logs. It's what the and top then you things. You can turn on this one. Yeah, you got to yeah. turn that on, and then you got to read it, and then dig it out and look at it and see what the numbers are looking like. So yeah, if you have questions about this, I, I you know we need to wrap it up. It's uh, about uh, well we're into this for about an hour and twenty five minutes. Um, I want you to encourage you to send an email to support at RC Consulting. Support at RC Consulting that will be very helpful. Uh, once again, if you want assistance with this for your own server, uh, Jacob Taylor is available, but uh, his limit of free tech support time is limited to what you just received. So. Outside of this, um, you're going to have people who need to pay for his time. So that's kind of the way that works. We're going to clean this video up and edit it. It'll be posted pretty much immediately, but we'll do a little bit of post uh, sanitization and cleanup on it. Tomorrow, Nick Hunter's back on how to wreck a FileMaker file. I think a little different topic entirely. So uh, cool. I appreciate it. Uh, that's it for now. Uh, we'll catch you tomorrow, everyone. Thanks.
and the guys just stepped up the whole way. Calm, cool, collected the quarterback. Great read, good patience. More importantly, great job up front protecting this quarterback to give you a chance. And that's all you can ask for. Trying to rally down 10. 925 to go here in the fourth. Short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot, goes down. Stands in, throws it left for Amendola. Reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10. Rolling to the 9. Ball slightly behind him, but Danny makes the grab.